Welcome everybody, welcome to Human Design Catalyst number 51. This is uh, incredible, I didn't really think when we started it that we'd get all the way, here we are, I think more than a year later, because we missed a few weeks, and um, still going strong. So, today we have a guest speaker, Andre Israelov, and um, I have a little note in the invite that uh, the, the topic the title of the talk is going to be Open Heart, Surrendered Mind. And Andre will be sharing uh, findings from his research into variable health, the endocannabinoid system, and other interesting things. I, I met Android, I'm sorry, Android. Andre, sorry, I, just, I, was, I was on an Android uh, page here. I'm closing a bunch of tabs from our previous. <laughs> Andre the Android, yes, he's fully cybernetic human. He is a uh, cyborg. He is, no. I met Andre um, through a shared interest in making human design apps. And in fact, we just uh, finished up our own private chat about a project he's working on, which I think he's going to tell us about as well, which is really exciting to me. Um, for those that don't know, I made a really rudimentary, really basic open source library for calculating human design uh, positions. Oh, hi there, John. I see you joined as well. Good to see you. Hi, all. Yeah. And I did this a couple years ago, but I kind of stopped um, before I was able to really integrate it to a full featured app where you would, you know, enter your birth location and it would tell you. But my, my idea of, I call it HD kit, my idea was just that there's so many paid websites out there and they all want you to pay to get color and variable. I mean, I guess you get variable for free, but a lot of them are paid for color and tone. And I just think it should be free. You know, there weren't, I was surprised actually, there weren't any open source human design software. There still might not be. I haven't checked for a while, but you know, it's, I guess I shouldn't be surprised because it's just, it's just kind of a you know reminder that what we're doing here is kind of the mutative edge, you know, it's the same thing as when I went to the uh, United Astrological Conference, which had 2,000 people from all over the world. It happens only once every four years, and it's the kind of leading lights of astrology worldwide, including scholars who devoted their whole life to astrology, and there were like four of us who did human design. So, <laughs> hi, Julie. Welcome, welcome. So I guess I shouldn't be too surprised, but in any case, um, I kind of abandoned that project. Not, I mean, I, I got it to a point where if you were able to enter in the planetary positions, it would tell you your gates and lines and color and tone and even base. And I did that because I just, again, wanted this information to be out there. I, I'm collective, it's about sharing, and I was kind of shocked that, you know, you have to pay money to find out this stuff? Come on, I mean, this is the internet age. It should all be freely available. So anyway, uh, flash forward a couple of years, and Andre got a hold of me and said, "Hey, I, I found your software online, and you know, can you can you tell me how it works? Because it wasn't very well documented. It still isn't." Um, and we did a video chat, and he told me all about the project he's working on, and we stayed in touch, and um, I'm really excited about it. So, so that's about all I have it by way of intro. Um, maybe maybe you can take it from here, Andre, or if you'd like me to talk any more about about that. Well, there was one other aspect of it. And could you refresh my memory? What is the other modality you've worked with where it involves people in certain positions and so on? And Family constellation therapy. Family constellation of. therapy. So what was so interesting to me also was that at literally the same day or possibly one day apart of Andre contacting me, I found out about family constellation therapy. And I've never actually done this, but it really captivated me. I've loved um, the work of, you know, Virginia Satir and Gestalt, and I love, um, I love any sort of astro drama kind of role play where you, you embody certain archetypal characters, you embody certain astrological archetypes and things like that. And I've done that before, and it's, it's been incredible. And so I, I don't know a lot about family constellation therapy, but when I read a synopsis of it, I thought, wow, this looks right up my alley. This is like pretty cool stuff. So maybe you can, I, I know that's not really the topic today, but if you'd like to, to share anything about that as well, you're more than welcome. But yeah, so anyway, I'm, I'm really excited when I mentioned to Andre just a few days ago um, that we're doing these meetings and that we don't have anyone to talk this week. And I asked if you'd like to join. He said, sure. And I said, well, would you like to present? <laughs> and, uh, and so here we are. <laughs> so. Thank you, Jonah. 
Uh, well, it's uh, nice to meet you all. Nice to see you all here. Um, I'm just minimizing my screen. Sorry, here it is. Um, thanks for that intro, Jonah. This was really special. Um, I did forget that we talked about Family Constellation, and Family Constellation for me is my foundation work for my project, and so is the Jinkies, and so is the human design, and so is cannabis, as it turned out later, because they there are synergies and there are patterns that sort of repeat themselves, and uh, they kind of play well together. Uh, about two years, three years ago, I was introduced to this group called Medicinal Mindfulness Day out of Boulder, Colorado. And this is a group that does psychedelic journeys with cannabis, uh, cannabis-induced journeys, where they do blends of up to 12 different stra strains of cannabis. Uh, and they smoke in, uh, uh, what's the word? Uh, ceremony. A ceremony environment with the music, with the intention mm -hmm. setting with laying down, closing your eyes, and going to these really, really deep five-hour-long journeys. Um, I loved it so much that I moved to Colorado myself to study with them and spend the last two years not only studying, but also sitting for other people. So we probably sat for hundreds, if not thousands of people by now. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, uh, bringing the knowledge of human design and family constellation, I began to see patterns in people. I began to see resistance. I began to see how the mind fights the body, how the body fights the mind. And uh, I knew there had to be something deeper than that. So I, uh, I ran my chart, of course, I'm my own guinea pig, and that's the best way to go. I ran my own chart, and I'm uh, very right brain, left mind. So uh, as it turned out that for someone like me, any, any stimulant, any coffee, any caffeine, any sativa, if you're familiar with strains, would actually put me in distress, would actually uh, put my metabolism out of the way. Um, we started adjusting that, so I started playing with the opposite and calming the brain down, and then the body sort of surrendered to it. So there was a surrender from both sides. Mm -hmm. I know Ra talks about, you know, like the strategy and authority is the number one thing, the PHS, don't even bother with it until you really grasp that. I don't know. Uh, maybe I'm too right and he was too left. I don't see it that way, at least in this context, because... When I began to uh, introduce this uh, this work to people we were sitting with, by explaining to them how their brain is designed, whether they're here to focus, whether they're here to be uh, observant, whether they're here to be meditative, that already puts them in a different context, uh, the whole thing in a different context, meaning the body is no longer in charge. The surrender happens a lot easier for them. Um, sorry, one second. My screen is doing tricks okay. can you all hear me yes oh yeah this is fantastic wonderful yeah. wonderful thank you um so by giving this information we began to see that uh it's not only just the strain but it's the mindset where people were able to begin the release and sort of surrender to the body in the process and that's where we sort of realized that mindfulness just like our minds is very unique for each individual, you know, once we find that uniqueness in us and we're able to name it and to feel it in a journey, we begin to understand that we're designed to be mindful very differently. So for someone who is completely right, 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 uh, it would be guided meditation where we would ask them to close their eyes and, you know, connect with the breath, connect with the sensation in the body, see what that brings up. And then I bring the family constellation aspect of it. And family constellation is based on ancestral trauma, that whatever we have is a baggage from ancestors. Not necessarily mom and dad. It could be up to three, four, five, six, seven generations back. I think there's a, there's a really cool gene key. I forget which one. It's the 12 or 42 that talks about how all of the core fears that we have, like fears of... Uh, not being good enough, inadequacy, and uh, not being loved, fears of being killed or to kill, they're all not ours. It's a collective consciousness that carries these. And uh, so we have access to them. So for someone in a mindful session, for someone who's completely right, I would connect them to their fear in the moment. Like what be what would be the worst fear in the moment? And a lot of times it would be something really annoying something like i'm afraid of sharks mm -hmm. and then you ask them well you know if the shark came about and you were swimming in the ocean you know 
to destroy this area. What is the worst that can happen? Well, it will bite off my leg. And if it bites off your leg, what's the worst about that right now for you? I won't be able to work. And if you can't work, I can't support my family. And if you can't support your family, I'll be left all alone. So we, our mind, our, our, our not self mind, which is for the right person on the left mind, creates these illusions uh, and smoke and mirrors of sharks, you know, a situation we'll probably be never encountered with. Uh, but yet underneath it all, once we distill it down, there's this really, really innocent core fear, ancestral fear of being left alone, not being loved, not being seen. Um, so what, what, what I feel like when the uniqueness of the mind is transparent to the end user, they begin to see themselves differently. And this is why I think, you know, for anyone stepping into human design, I think it's crucial to know the PHS, even early on, you know, probably just as early as you know about just uh, strategy and authority, because I don't think they can coexist. Uh, they cannot not coexist. They have to go together. Um, so in, uh, in furthering our work with cannabis, we began to see that the hybrid, for instance, comes in very handy when someone is half right, half left, or top left, bottom right, uh, bottom right, yeah. Um, hybrids balance those out very, very interestingly because, again, mind, a right brain with a left mind will create that scenario where you need a stimulant, but that you need a still relaxed brain to take that stimulant in to create that mind. So uh, hybrids play very well in it. And for someone like that, a meditation would be not to simply be uh, mindful and sitting still, but perhaps even walking around, depending on their environment. Of course, walking around while meditating, maybe walking along the ocean or something like that. So this is, this is our project, basically. It's taking your variable, figuring out your brain, Figuring out, figuring out your mind, figuring out your um, um, environment as well. I think it's crucial. And your perspective. All of these things come into play in designing an individual, unique approach to mindfulness. An individual, uh, unique approach to self. So we can bypass that which is ancestrally inherited as a shadow side and convert it to gift by simply acknowledging it, by simply staying in it, staying with it, uh, however you want to call it. Um, and that's that's the project that uh, Jonah is helping us out with, uh, trying to figure out the calculation. The rest is community-based. Uh, the goal is to keep the app completely free for the end user. And the app is really about unique mindfulness, but then there are different fields where this can grow into, like cannabis industry, for instance. Right now, you walk into a store, uh, you know, whether you're buying hemp or whether you're buying cannabis, they'll tell you, well, this is sativa, this will make you happy, and this is indica, this will put you in a couch. Well, this is not true. For someone who is right like me, I can take indica, I can run around like crazy, and I'll take sativa, I'll probably lay in bed shaking, I'll have anxieties, memory loss, fall asleep, I'll have so-called munchies, because these are all side effects. Right. Anytime, even traditional medicine, if it's not cor if it's not correctly taken, if the intention is not there, and if it's not designed for a mind system, it's gonna play. Uh, it's gonna play not in a nice way with us. So the idea is to bring this technology into to the grower, that grow conscious uh, product, so we can actually test their product, classify it in the app, and then once a person. Uh, runs their uh, runs their information within the app. They can walk into a store and know exactly which product is designed for their brain system and why, and how to take it, and you know how to go about taking it, and how to really grow with it. Um, another funny thing is that we noticed recently is just because you're right uh, doesn't mean that you can never take sativas because they're too stimulant. No, it's just that once we come back to the self mind we were able to observe the differences and not react to it. In other words, we can still observe an active mind in a very right environment, but we don't have to act on it. Because when we are not, when we are not in self-mode and we are right, we take sativa, we, the body tries to listen to that mind and does these crazy things, but it has no fuel to, to run on. Mm -hmm. So it burns out very quickly and... This is how disease really happens, is when we're mismatched and when we misuse the resources. And then 
the endocannabinoid system comes into play because that's that's the sweetest spot i think because this is where that balance of homeostasis is really created like our body's already made, made makes its own cannabinoids thc and cbd equivalent and the receptors that we have in our in our bodies in our organism is designed to take that in and to create that balance of homeostasis in other words to put the body into the mode of self-healing and this is where i feel PHS is really helpful because if that's not configured correctly, there's no hope of homeostasis. I mean, we can force it with chemicals, we can force it with some mindful techniques, but there's there's always resistance. It's not as smooth as it, as it could be. It's not as smooth as it should be. Um, and I feel like when, when these two are balanced, when the correct product is consumed with the right intention and with the right mindset, then the rest is smooth sailing, then no medicine is needed. We can keep it all natural. Does all that make sense? Yeah. 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 Andre, I, it's Esther. I, I have a question for you because when you said collective trauma, immediately I thought of Thomas Hubel. Do you know Thomas Hubel? I do not, no. He's uh, actually German born but lives in Israel right now. And he does a lot of work around, you know, sort of like defining, like making, you know, what we feel is very personal. Mm-hmm. you know, experience, you know, sort of making it more global. And he does a lot of work around that. So I don't know, maybe that's somebody you might want to look at. Yeah, thank you. I find thank it so appreciate it. Yeah. yeah. Anyone else? Any questions? Uh, yeah, I, I have a lot of interest. I mean, I kind of want to just go over some of what you said. I'm also trying to Please. figure out, I had penned... I don't know if it's pinning for everybody. I pinned you while you were speaking, but I was trying to unpin so I could see everyone else on here. Okay, I can see everybody again. Um, so yeah, just kind of going over what you said. So in general, you're finding that sativa is is more hearkening to the left because it's so stimulating that a left... I mean, it kind of makes sense to me just at an intuitive level that left variable... Um, has more attachment, more connection to the spleen, for instance, the seven centered beings, and left variable is going to be either first, second, or third tone. Well, first and second tone are splenic. So so that kind of makes sense to me at an intuitive level. And then you're finding that the indicas tend to be more suited for the right variable because maybe the gentler, less stimulating, I mean, I, 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 I know these words aren't really totally appropriate, but so that's that I'm kind of understanding. Are there any is there any connection to the spleen? Like do you find I mean I have an undefined spleen and I, I've wondered being an undefined spleen, it seems that I'm just more sensitive in general, even though I'm very left. You know, I'm a very left person, so it's kind of an interesting combination here. But uh, I only have one right variable, which is my environment. But because I have an undefined spleen, I find myself very sensitive to things. And I was wondering if I mean, it might be too soon in your research to have any generalization about the spleen. Maybe it's more just particular to the person. But have you found patterns with the spleen? Have you found? Uh, no, not really, not yet. Yeah. But one thing about leftness, it's a very strategic mind. So it's like a supercomputer that focuses right at zeros in. And one thing that I find that's very dangerous to that type of mind is multitasking. Ah. And that's so, and that's so common, right? It's so common because the minute we start multitasking, then we we're dispersing the resources that are designed to be focused on one little thing. Mm-hmm. This is where I feel sativa really helps because what it does, it ignites, it ignites this focus for someone who is yeah. left. Yeah. For someone who is right, it does the opposite. <laughs> it, sure. does, it's like, yeah. it does like a 180, if not more. But uh, uh, another thing to remember, you'll notice that the dietary regimen for someone someone like yourself is, uh, it, it, whatever the dietary regimen is, food is really important for a left brain because that's where the fuel really comes from. Mm-hmm. So let's say uh, this is why... Uh, I think, you know, the dietary uh, suggestions, the nutritional suggestions that are there for the mass market that are very homogenized are really dangerous that way because for someone who is left, they really need their nutrients. Like it's not good for them to uh, uh, to fast whatsoever because then they are unable to focus. And when they try to focus, then the whole body falls apart as far as the metabolism goes. The only, the only thing I'll say about this is that the lower trigram colors, um, the appetite, thirst, or, you know, appetite, taste, and thirst, for them, it's the most dangerous to fast. And I've always, when I ask them about it, 
if they've skipped a meal or gone too long, they get really spacey and checked out. Now, I'm actually fourth color, and even though I am left variable, I actually have the same as rides, fourth color um, com, which is left variable. But the fourth, fifth, and sixth, even if they're left variable, they need less food than the first, second, and third. Or I, I should put it this way, you know, Ra himself fasted, you know, for kind of heroic fasts. And wow. what he had claimed was that, that one of the, the big problems for people that are, yeah, basically first, second, or third tone, or first, second, or third color, that th they need to make sure they're getting the right nutrients and eating enough. For someone like myself, it's kind of in the middle, almost like a hybrid in that sense, in that there's a little mismatch. I'm an upper trigram color, but a lower trigram tone. And so like Ra, um, we do sometimes, you know, I actually sometimes do find that I've, that there's a precarious balance of food where, yeah, if I don't eat enough, I'm going to be spacey. But if I eat too much, I get a terrible food coma. And I always, you know, before I knew about human design, I would read things about how an actor getting ready for an audition would starve themselves, or I'd read about intermittent fasting, or I'd read about these things. And yeah, it's not good for me to do, I mean, I do get really spacey and checked out. I feel my cognition go away because I do have a left brain. I mean, it's very active. Um, it's an active brain system. It burns a lot of calories. I mean, the brain uses actual literal calories. This is not even mysticism. It's just science. You know, you look at somebody with a very active brain, uh, it burns a lot of calories. At the same time, because it is fourth color, there is kind of a balance there. It's different than if I were lower, lower trigram. Um, and then yeah. it's also important to remember that it burns a lot of calories only when you focus. If you don't, yes. if, you, if, you choose, if you choose not to, then it works against you. So right. it's important to remember to burn it. And, and I've also wondered about, you know, one way that I like to think about it with variable between um, just looking at the personality sun earth versus the design sun earth is that the personality sun earth is kind of what I have conscious access to and what is the more visible component where I'm third tone on that front, uh, just like Ra, and um, I'm, I'm third color, third tone. And the third tone is left variable, but it's periodic left variable. And so I will periodically leap into action. And then, so when I'm not, I'm kind of spaced out and I'm not really paying attention and I'm, you know, and so there, that is interesting to notice that yeah, when I've really been in a on state, that's when I really need those, those calories. And then the other thing is just that I've noticed that with myself, when that happens, when my left mind clicks on, because it's a periodic mind, it's not always on, but when it clicks on, then I start to really exercise my brain. And that's, and that's for me, it's compatible because they're both left. But I can see how someone with the right brain, it's kind of like they're, you know, they're like whipping the horse and the horse is like, no, I just want to eat the grass. What are you doing? Why are you trying to make me go there? You know? And so there's these interesting combinations where depending on your leftness and your rightness, you're going to have different um, kind of unique configurations in that way. It's, it's important. So, yeah. Well, um, I, I love hearing about this. If you have other things you'd like to share, I'd also like to open it up. My good friend, Kevin, I've had many conversations with him. Oh, and if you have anything, Julie, as well, I'd be curious to hear, hear Kevin's ideas because we've had so many conversations about cannabis in the past as well. If you, but if you have something first, Julie, please, please jump in. I'm, I'm so excited about this, this conversation. I'm frozen on my, I don't know. Can you see me? Yeah. I'm yeah. You, you can hear you. You're okay. all good. I'm frozen with this big tack in the middle of my forehead. It's good. Um, <laughs> So I'm so excited about this conversation because it's been confusing to me. And um, so I'm left, but I have uh, my third arrow is right. And your personality I, sun earth. Yeah. Person so for Julie, sorry to interrupt, but Julie has yeah, personality no. sun earth right variable. Everything else is left variable for her. Right. And everything uh, else is left. Yes. Yes. Okay. And I'm a sativa smoker and I, um, do that because it helps me out of confusion I thought but maybe it doesn't and so I've not explored the indica and I also have um my senses meditation so this is just real this just makes me very curious because part of my my smoking is to bring clarity and get me out of confusion um so I'm just curious what what the conversation is around um, the right arrow with awareness. 
Mm -hmm. So your everything else about you is left, correct? Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, sativa. Uh, it, it's more like a sativa dominant hybrid. That's good for you. So it's not a hundred percent sativa. Okay. Because your perspective is still right. Your perspective is still sort of meditative. It's not focused. Uh, so I would highly recommend playing either with two strains like you can buy a really strong sativa and you can buy a really strong indica and then mix them 75 25 percent and find your own blend um, that that always helps but it's the process of learning about your awareness in that state and uh, i would highly recommend if you were to play with cannabis and observing your uh, phs mind is to start small like start a couple of pools like Couple of couple of drags of uh, flour, or tea. I highly recommend smoking or vaping rather than eating because it's a very different process of uh, THC conversion in the body because it doesn't go through the liver. Uh, and starting small, just with a couple of a uh, couple of drags, and sitting with it, meditating with it, and checking in with the body, especially if you have uh, meditation in your chart as well. Uh, that's your uh, that's your awareness. That's her. Uh, um, that is my senses meditation. Which is which is personality. Yeah, it's personality sun earth tone. Yeah. Sorry to just yeah. jump in. Yeah. Got um, it. No, no, that's helpful. Thank you. But the other thing that you said too is that um, I I'm very physical. Like I'm a dancer. I'm I'm a moving meditator. So I just you just said some things. I'm like oh I'm not so like it just thank you for this conversation because. Um, just thank you for this conversation. I'm yeah, my pleasure. About it. My pleasure. I think what's helpful with cannabis and meditation, especially moving meditation, is to be aware of what's going on inside rather than outside as you're doing it. Let's say if you're dancing, if you're walking, just noticing what the body does. And if you check in, let's say, with the fear, whatever the biggest fear might be in that particular meditation or any intention that you said, see what that feels like. So in other words, internalizing the feeling while while surrendering the mind to the medicine and the dance and the walk, whatever that might be. So using that as a distraction while we go inward to find where that awareness takes us in the body so the body can actually welcome the mind in a right way. Yeah. Thank you. You're very welcome. Well, I have a couple of things, but does anyone else have comments or questions first? Or... Um... Yeah, I, I, can, I mean, I can I can jump in with a few a few ideas. So one was um, going back to kind of my own research into cannabis and into undefined centers and so on. One of the reasons I was curious about the spleen, and you know, I'm I'm cross of healing. Wait, are you also cross of healing, Andre? Or what 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 are you? What is no. service? Cross of service, but you share two of the same gates of the cross of healing. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. So me being on cross of healing. Um, the not self of the cross of healing is like the worst control freak savior telling everybody what to do all the time to, to, uh, under the auspices of healing them, you know, heal, like you shouldn't do that. You should do this. Sit still, you know, don't, don't go there, change your diet, whatever. And a big part of my deconditioning has been to just keep it all to myself and realize that kind of, even if it sounds like a hallmark aphorism, it's usually and it's usually phrased in the religious context of God helps those who help themselves. You know, setting aside that, what it really means is just good things happen. You know, if you if you really attend to your own health, and that's a huge point of growth for the cross of healing. So for me personally, a big part of my deconditioning process was getting really sick and just having a lot of illness come to the forefront, almost as if you know I have a first line body. And health is often, you know, related in part at least to the line um, of your design, sun, earth. And having a first line body, being a 5'1", um, you know, I had a lot of underlying things that came up over time and, and really kind of all emerged and came to the forefront. It took me a number of years to really get a handle on my health or to get to a point where I felt healthy again after starting the design experiment. That's one of the most, just as a side note, one of the most fascinating areas to me is how each incarnation cross is kind of like the seed that grows into the tree through that deconditioning. And that the seed for the cross of healing, you know, it's almost, they're almost better off either not, do, not doing human design or going all in. Because if they go halfway, they're just going to end up with a bunch of health problems because they get halfway there as all the health problems merge. And so for my own personal 
journey to health, I, I ended up being greatly helped by a um, homeopath, naturopath named Richard Mann, who's brilliant. He's about 75 years old now. And one of the things he had me do was to completely eliminate any cannabis usage, which I did for a number of years. Because, now he didn't know human design, I did his chart and the chart of his wife. And pretty much every homeopath whose chart I've ever done has had undefined spleen. Like my pet theory, and I've heard of this kind of corroborated elsewhere, is that homeopathy doesn't really work for the defined spleen. They just metabolize it instantly. I had a couple defined spleen people say, no, I think it did something, but... But in my case, homeopathy worked extremely well. And part of it was that the cannabis usage, he at least claimed would interfere with it. I mean, he had claimed mint would interfere with it. I couldn't eat mint. I couldn't have any strong oils. I couldn't have coffee. I gave up coffee for three years. You know, my, my friend Von Paul was joking. I told him this and he's known me for some years. And he said, well, Jonah, I'll see you next week if you don't drop dead first from no coffee and no pot. <laughs> You know, he's like, you're going to shock your system, cutting out all of these uh, things that you've relied on. Not that I ever, you know, I, I was never such a habitual smoker that it was all the time. But, you know, it would be a little bit, because I did realize even then, even before really knowing about the undefined spleen, that I was very sensitive to it. So that's one of the kind of side points is just coming to understand the spleen and that the impact that has in health, how an undefined spleen person is going to have. I mean, I would think that it wouldn't really change any of your research into variable. It might just um, be more of an indication of trying things like microdosing, you know, or trying very, very tiny amounts. Because sometimes I'll think that I need more of something and I, I really don't. Um, the other aspect of it is that I'm taste on the design side, as I mentioned, just like raw. And so with taste, it's, it's, a lot of it is getting very small amounts of something. Like the small amount kind of works for me. I realize I don't really like drinking alcohol. I like tasting. I like doing a scotch tasting and having the tiniest sip. And so by the end of it, I've had one drink, but it's been an hour or something, you know, because I'm getting the taste of it. So that's another aspect of it. And mm -hmm. then um, finally, just the other, I just kind of was thinking, of, well, so, so two more things. And these are a little bit scattered. Feel free to jump in if any of this, uh, you know, pattern matches. Um, making a little left variable joke there, because left variable is all left <laughs> variable. But, uh, but, but the, the, two other, the two other aspects, one is that um, the format energies, the format energies play a very big role in health. And this would be actually a worthy topic for a future human design catalyst. We'll be talking about the format energies. There's three format channels. They go from the, the root to the sacral. And the three format channels, um, really indicate a lot of things about health. And they correspond to the three miasms or miasmas of homeopathy. This is interesting. If you look at, you know, the spiritualist kind of founder of homeopathy, Hahnemann, he had this theory that there are three fundamental, I mean, I'm sure that there's also, you might know more than I, I in this, this matter, Andrea. I, I'm not sure if you've you know, studied this, aspects of, this aspect of it. But in any case, I have the 952, and that's the dry one. And so for me, the dry one is a lot of problems of dryness and it's repetitive ailments. It's basically not really getting any new sicknesses very rarely, only if I get a lot of conditioning from an individual person that something new can mutate, but actually having things that I had when I was a little kid that continue to come back throughout my life. It's very different for someone like Jenny we have here who has the other two formats. And it's interesting when you have, uh, oh, wait, sorry, just the one. Sorry, just the one format. Right, just the one, I was thinking of uh, Vaughn has the other two. So Jenny has the wet format channel, the 4253. So for her, it's, it's things that emerge and health issues that kind of have a be beginning and a middle and an end. And then, and that's it, it's the, you know, it's the abstract process. You go through the experience of having a health issue. And then I was gonna say for, for someone like my friend Vaughn, um, who's gonna be arriving in Santa Fe actually, he's, he's moving here for a while. Um, he has two of the format channels and you get into all sorts of nuances of what happens when, when you combine those. Um, so I'm not really relating that particularly to cannabis usage, but it does seem like a missing piece to me. At least, at least it's been part of my health journey. So I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't necessarily want to say that it's so relevant in your research, but it might be something, might be something just if you happen to notice, oh wow, these 952 people, 
they get stuck into this you know repetitive thing and for them it's about realizing what what is going to keep repeating until they improve or change it because it's logical and for someone like jenny it's more about where is she is she ready to be at the end of an experience or at the beginning of a new experience um, and then my my final oh yeah so do you have, do you have a comment on that at all do you have any do you have, yeah I actually do have nine fifty two as well so I know oh. exactly what you're talking about oh perfect okay. <laughs> I feel like with cannabis and this is something we were just actually recently talking about how it, it, it is a not self drug if you think about it right because it's it, it's got this whole negative aspect baggage that comes with it right um i call it a gateway medicine even though people call it gateway drug because i think once the intention is there once the awareness is there once the alignment is there then it's a true medicine but if you're taking it recreational without any of that aspect then it, it, it has no choice but to be a not self drug because it will it will induce that state even more so mm-hmm. so whatever whatever was not not self will be magnified in it. And uh, again, I've abused it for 25 years until I discovered that it is a medicine and it could be used, you know, only the last few years. So I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm a guinea pig number one. <laughs> Definitely oh, yeah. seen that work. Um, and I think what also helps with the 952 especially is knowing your emotional body, knowing that that particular one fear at any given time, whatever that fear might be, because that's the trigger. That's the trigger that brings the old trauma. I mean, for everyone, but for nine nine fifty two even more so. So anytime we get sick, uh, I, I like John Sarno's work. If you guys are familiar, he's a medical doctor out of NYU. He passed away a few years ago. He is a pain medicine doctor, and he is known to be a, a chronic a chronic pain specialist. In his work with thousands of patients, he discovered that it's all psychosomatic, right? And the brain brain brings on the disease, but he explains the mechanism. The way the brain works, it defends us, basically. When the emotion comes up, which is familiar to a fetus or to a child to be equivalent of extinction, Mm-hmm. Because when we were in utero and mom was uh, emotionally pulled away because her father passed away, she was emotionally pulled away because she was depressed uh, you know, while being pregnant, the child feels the abandonment. So for the child, that particular moment is, oh my God, I will stop to exist right now because it doesn't even know death yet. So the mind already back then creates a smoke and mirror diversion, rather a diversion, which could be uh, an allergic reaction. It could be... Uh, it could be a bunch of other different things. It could be an itch. It could be an inflammation, which is mostly, most of the time what happens. So the mind does this from the very early stage of its development. So when we grow up and this emotion comes up, emotion of being abandoned, the mind says, you know what? We're afraid of that. We're just afraid of sharks. We're not paying attention to this, to this particular emotion. Why do we have an itch? Why do we have a cold? Why do we have, uh, why do we have cancer? Why do we have a heart attack? So it creates these things because now it takes our attention away from it. And we're busy catering to that particular uh, uh, situation. We go see a doctor. Our loved ones bring us a cup of tea. We feel loved. So it's all externalizing love, basically. But meanwhile, the abandonment inside happens from that defense. So the mind, even though it's helping us, it's slowly killing us. And yeah. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. That's sorry. Do, do you do you have more to say on that? Because that, that no, um, just just yeah. just to think that his work is fascinating. I highly recommend reading it because it really brings the power back to ourselves and back back into our bodies and recognizing this relationship between the mind and the body. I think how crucial it is, and it's mm-hmm. very easy to catch with a fear alone because in any given moment there is a fear, and if we simply name it, not do anything about it, not judge it, simply awareness of that fear, it's gone. Like, I have spring allergies. I've had them all my life. I've had Claritin and Benadryl, like, pumped into me daily until I recognized that allergies are simply uh, my defense mechanism for intimacy. Self-intimacy is, like, self-vulnerability. So now when I get them every once in a while, uh, all I have to do is just close my eyes and say, what is it that I'm not comfortable with now? What is it that I'm afraid of? And a lot of times there'll be something really silly. But naming it sort of like turns it off and it's completely gone, you know, without any medicine whatsoever. And by the way, while we're still talking about allergies, one thing I also noticed that for a lot of people, when they mismatch their strains, they get allergic reaction. Mm-hmm. So uh, some people will touch the flower and then they touch their skin, they'll get the hive. So they'll get their nose congested or something will tickle in the throat. That's another sign that you're being mismatched. 
other than smelling it and going by smell, regardless of your of your design, actually. I think the nose really knows what the body wants and what the body needs. Mm -hmm. Well, and I can imagine for a first tone person, smell would be even more important. I mean, more even uh, more so. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Well, and 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 for me, you know, I have taste cognition, and I absolutely. Sometimes I do have that strong smell reaction, like I'll just go, no, that's not for me. But I also will get the taste reaction of it, where I go, oh, that doesn't taste right. Um, well, the other, the other thing I was going to say earlier, which was about, um, it kind of ties into what you're saying about these, these triggers. And, you know, I, I was going to, so I've had a lot of conversations with Kevin, uh, Casey Nordman on here, who I've known for 20 years now. And we've talked a lot over the years about habitual cannabis usage and you know, there's a lot of different directions to go with that conversation. Um, one, it, one of the interesting ones for me is looking at the work of the French philosopher Gilles Deleuze, which I won't go into too far, but Deleuze had a really profound, deep insight that essentially when you're um, in working in any creative work, which is really just all work, I mean, all work is creative. Scientists are creating new formulas and new experiments. I mean, everyone's creative to some degree. But when you're working in this creative work, it's so important um, in your creative work to have a congruent world that you create, that your work lives in, but that world also mirrors your own habits. And that it's kind of an obscure point, but it's basically that every artist is not only struggling to make a coherent work of art, they're also struggling to have a coherent life where they can continue to make art. And so for Deleuze, he uh, very sadly um, perhaps succumbed to some of his addictions. He was an alcoholic, he wrote incredible books, but then eventually his alcoholism destroyed his liver, he couldn't drink anymore, and he committed suicide. Um, very, very tragic, um, although he was able to write a lot of great books from that. Well, I've talked with Kevin over the years, and if, if you have any ideas, Kevin, feel free to jump in. I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but we've talked a lot about habits and the wear and tear on the body of habits, even something as simple. I mean, I know now that there's vaporizing and other ways of of doing things, but um, just the actual wear and tear on the lungs of smoking. And, you know, I can say personally speaking, what I've come around to is a sort of understanding or a checking in of what is part, what, what is congruent, what, what habits are helping you to continue to be creative or helping you, in my case, as a generator, what it's really about is where I'm putting my sacral energy. So what habits of mine are atrophying my sacral energy? Because that's where a lot of illness comes from. Ross says the mental illness comes from the not-self. This is kind of paraphrasing. But the physical illness comes from the unused definition in the chart quite often. You know what I mean? Um, and, and, you know, it, it can be psychosomatic to have a, something from an undefined center. But it can also just be a generator who's not using their sacral energy. When their sacral center atrophies, they get very ill from that. So yeah, do you have any 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 comments, Kevin? Anything from our conversations that that's jumped out? I don't want to put you on the spot, but because uh, we've talked a lot about it. Sorry, it was a little bit muffled. Sorry, elementary school. Sorry, can you start over? That was really muffled. Oh, is that, is, can you, uh, it's good now. It's good now. I think it was oh, okay. just going to be uh, there. Sorry. Uh, and, uh, you know, I didn't feel normal all through it. I always kind of wondered about the internal world of people, you know. Um, and honestly, I didn't feel normal again until I started as a teenager. Uh, but, you know, with me at some point, it's come to a point where it seems like it's, uh, it's messing with my body. You know, I'm having uh, chronic bronchitis, that kind of stuff. So I quit. And... Um, it, uh, that stuff clears up, but I did notice that uh, I was always a sativa person, and for me, it made me focus, and kind of all the world's things happened, and I could just focus on the task. Uh, so now I'm kind of back there, you know, just not smoking, and uh, kind of trying to figure out what's going on, you know, whether um, I'm going to come to some kind of normal or, or not. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, we've had a lot of conversations over the years about it. And, you know, I, I was really curious, especially because I, I completely quit smoking any pot at all for years. Now I, now I smoke CBD, which is another thing I really want to ask you about, you know, Andre, is if this, because there are sativa and indica strains of CBD, but the THC is so minimal. Very curious about that. Just hold it for one second because I want to um, 
look at Kevin's body graph right here just to see what, because he mentioned that the sativas were always what he was drawn to. I'm just curious about variable there. But, but, but one of the things that I remember realizing is that when I had quit smoking pot, I would sometimes want it. And I would look at, I would try to track when I would want it. Like, like when do I feel? And this is something I completely, my own original research, uh, I haven't seen elsewhere and I haven't really corroborated, but, but I've talked to Kevin about this. So, so Kevin has everything defined except the head and the root. So Kevin has seven out of nine centers defined. And what I've noticed talking to Kevin is that a lot of our conversations, I have an undefined head, a lot of our conversations would end up in this space of trying to solve problems, often other people's problems, by thinking about them to extreme limits. You know, My mom, for instance, would have a lot of problems and say, well, where should I move and what should I do? And I'd be thinking about trying to help her problems or people in you know, Kevin's life would have some issue. And you'd be thinking so much. And after all of that mental activity, you'd be like, God, I just want to smoke a joint, <laughs> you know, and I realized that, or, or I just want a beer, or I just want to, you know, something, some sort of, the, the addictive impulse would only really be there as a way of getting rid of all that mental pressure, and so I, I don't know if this has been found elsewhere, or if it has to do with other, you know, but I never really had that, you know, I have undefined ego, it was never like, oh, my feelings are hurt, I want to smoke a joint, or I have undefined solar plexus, it was never like, oh, I'm feeling really nervous about confronting this person. I want to get high to escape. Other people, maybe, maybe the escapist tendency. For me, it was never like that. Or, oh, I miss this person, my undefined spleen. You know, all of these other undefined centers, to me anyway, never actually triggered in the same way. And I, I think it's kind of like what you were saying, Audrey, about how um, pot can be, you know, I guess we should say, you know, cannabis, because it is more respectful talking about it as a medicine. Um, it can be really not self. It can be really mental. And so it would make sense that it's the not self of the, the head, perhaps, all the pressure coming in that would be part of it. Of And even kind of what Julie said about, well, I, I smoke it to uh, make sense of things so I can get rid of the confusion. Well, confusion is in gate 64. I mean, that's, that's a head thing, you know. Um, so anyway, I, do you have any comments on any of this, Andre? Are you, are you anything... Jumping out. Uh, I think you're spot on. Uh, I want to talk about the CBD a little bit. I think it's oh, really, yeah. it's a really wonderful uh, hemp is a really wonderful plant. It's uh, cannabis's cousin. By the way, something I forgot to mention earlier. Um, lots of uh, lots of different cultures uh, believe that cannabis is a feminine spirit. Uh, has a feminine spirit, more like a motherly, uh, where ayahuasca is considered to be more of a grandmother. Uh, I kind of like it because in the journeys themselves, uh, if we recognize that we are taking something that has a feminine spirit, the idea there already that we have to be receptive. The idea there that in order for us to meet the spirit, we have to be receptive like with any other woman. If you really want to connect with any woman, you have to allow yourself to be vulnerable. You know, and you have to be um, in your heart doing so. And it's like, with cannabis especially, it's like approaching a really big ugly dog, a scary dog, and not knowing what to do with it. We don't just stick our hand out there, right? We allow it to smell us, and we watch its ears, we watch the tail, we watch the body language, and then we sort of drop into the body so that can really come back together. I think with cannabis, regardless whether you're left or right, it's a crucial, crucial element, is remembering the plant is alive, it has a life spirit, and it's feminine. All it wants is for you to be honest and open because if you're not then the not self thing comes forth and it comes and it can hit you like a ton of bricks i mean i've been there i've had some really 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 horrible trips on cannabis especially in the very beginning when i wasn't really aware and i was just taking lots of sativa and wasn't really prepared to be open in a moment wasn't really prepared to be vulnerable and just wanted to be to go along for the ride kind of you know sitting for other people and of course cannabis has uh, other ideas and this will not fly so vulnerability being 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 receptive uh, in a moment is crucial uh, with any psychedelic really but with cannabis is more so and as far as uh, hemp goes um, hemp is really amazing especially if you find smokable hemp something that's not as industrial um, 
it might have some higher levels of THC. A lot of them are still being sold, sold on the internet, even though they claim there is 0.3% of THC. Most of them, most of them are 1% to 3% of THC, which is not a lot. It will give you that light, uh, uh, light buzz, as they say. But the terpene quality is tremendous. 